Excellent. I'm not seeing any attendees, but we'll go ahead and get started. So hello everyone and welcome to our second pre-IC session of the 2024 year. Today we will be learning about a session called Celebrating 50 Years of Torrance and FPS, a Renaissance of Academic Challenge. Presenting this session will be Dr. Connie Phelps, who graduated from Texas A&M Commerce, the University of Arkansas, and Emporia State University with degrees in elementary education and gifted special education. After teaching gifted students in Wichita Public Schools, she directed the gifted education program at Emporia State University in Kansas, where she received the inaugural Dr. John E. King Endowed Professor Award for Teaching. Her research interests include international collaborations on creative giftedness and creative problem solving. She currently serves on the FPSPI Board of Trustees and evaluates scenario performances at the International Conference. In fall 2024, she plans to return to the public school classroom as a gifted facilitator. Facilitator, goodness. So go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Allison and April, for this invitation. This is so exciting to, to see all that's happened in the last 50 years. And I hope that at the end of this uh, webinar that you'll have a greater appreciation of how we got to where we are now from where we were then. And I like to think about um, E. Paul Torrance as maybe kind of looking over at us somehow or another and smiling. So here we go. So in 1974, E. Paul Torrance began an academic competition that um, was really a grassroots level because the local schools asked, hey, we need something for these students that's challenging. Can you do something for us? And with his vast experience, and we'll talk a little bit more about his life as we go, and some of you may have met him and know a lot more about Dr. Torrance. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, although I've studied his work quite a bit, I, I never had the good fortune to meet him. So that is really the origin, was a request. Can you do something for our students to challenge them? And so that's how it evolved and really, there's a lot behind the scenes that most people don't really know. But in 1974, Dr. Torrance was already heavily, heavily involved in the research of creativity. The research of creativity really got kicked off in 1950 with, um, with Guilford's address at the APA, which is the American Psychological Association. And Torrance was very involved because of his military service, because of his doctoral training, because of his research. He was very much in the front runners of everything that was happening in creative research, and particularly as it had um, as it related to schools. So that's pretty exciting, and that's what I mean by uh, future problem solving actually helped galvanize higher level thinking skills in schools because of the, the, the solid background that he had, that Torrance had in research and the inspiration he took from his colleagues. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, the really cool thing about academic competitions is that students do receive recognition for both individual and co collective performance goals, depending on the competition itself. So here we are now 50 years later, and I, I'm hoping that Dr. Torrance, wherever he is, is, is just um, really celebrating with us today. So what, what are academic competitions? Why are they important? What benefits do they have? And here you'll see a picture from a previous competition uh, from um, the International Conference. So I'd like to, to start this talk with a broader look at what academic competitions are and how uh, future problem solving fits into academic competitions. Um, you know, it's interesting because if you Google search future problem solving, it really doesn't show up as an academic competition. It's kind of like it's its own special thing, but let's, let's take a look here. So as those of you who are watching this um, see these two images, what do you see? What kind of competition is this? Because this is one of the very first types of competitions, at least in the United States. Um, anybody want to take a guess? Well, if you said spelling bees, 
you'd be right <laughs> because the scripts um spelling national spelling bee started uh, very early in the 19th century in the 20th century rather and that was a a type of competition where bees where uh, it was a type of gathering where where um, students and and the community met uh, like there were quilting bees back in the day where um, people gathered together to do quilting, which, you know, wasn't necessarily an academic competition. But spelling bees kind of maybe took its inspiration from that type of a gathering back in the day. So let's see if you've got that one, you're on a roll. Let's see what we, we do on the next one. Well, what do you think these two uh, images represent? Well, this is the year of the Olympics in Paris. So if you said the Olympics, you'd be right on that too. So good for you. Well, the Olympics are another type of competition and, and academic competitions took inspiration from the Greek Olympics of, um, of many decades ago now and uh, and so sometimes academic competitions are modeled after that type of um, effort, a very rigorous expert level with gold medals, silver and bronze, and the whole works. Okay, now this next one's a little bit harder. So you're gonna have to go a little deeper on this one. So the first word, there are two words here and the first word is actually a big clue on on the um, the side that says academics. And then if you think about the other side where there's a little boy running, think about the type of group that that uh, person might belong to. And you put those two words together, you're going to have it. So any guesses? Well, if you said academic leagues, <laughs> You'd be right again. Congratulations. Okay, so here's a list. And now maybe you can kind of see, I put them in order here so that you could see where future problem solving fits in. And if we go way back to the early 1900s, we see that Model UN was very, um, was really the first. And if you know anything about Model UN, you know that it's a lot about countries getting along together. Um, and if you think about the time frame of that, you know that World War II, excuse me, World War I uh, probably inspired it. <laughs> so at, the, at Oxford in England, the very first model UN started. And then um, the next one, the next notable one, and these are still going today. Everything that's on this list is still going today. Harvard started a model UN as well. So uh, young people learn to uh, lear learn what it means to be a delegate, for instance, to participate in a group, to understand problems uh, that belong to various countries and so on. We already talked about the spelling bee. And are you going to, do you see some similarities here? Because, you know, that's part of critical thinking, isn't it? To see um, similarities with lists of words, with uh, patterns and things like that. So I want you to take a good look at this list. There's 15 additional competitions uh, along with future problem solving. So do you see those three areas that we just had the little um, images for? So you certainly can see B and maybe that's the only one on this list. But um, as you look further, you'll see there are Olympiads, there's leagues, and then there's very specific academic types of competition, much like the spelling bee. So in addition to spelling, we have French and math and history and science. So we got all the big ones there pretty much if you want to count Model UN and social sciences. We got the academics covered. But you know, as you look at this list and you see some other things like maybe the National um, Academic League, I actually coached that when I taught gifted in Wichita. And so I'm pretty familiar with that one, which is um, uh, for middle school students. And interestingly, it has a model that's a little bit similar to FPS. Uh, so they they have, for instance, uh, performances and things like that, and as does History Day. So 
Um, and then see another one that maybe is a little bit similar in some ways with Future City, but it is um, a little more limited in terms of um, how it addresses the competition. Uh, the first Lego League is very exciting. That's more of a STEM thing and then destination imagination. So the challenge for you, as you're looking at this list and you see, yeah, there's specific academic subjects. So if I really like French, then maybe I want to get involved with that. Or maybe I really, really love, um, I love Lego. And by the way, Lego is already plural. So you never need to add an S to it. Just FYI. And um, the Danish people are very strong on that. Um, so as you look at this list, is there anything here that you think doesn't involve problem solving? Like for instance, if you're trying to figure out how to spell a word, you need to know some basic rules, but then you're gonna have to use some problem solving strategies to figure out, is it this kind of spelling? or maybe it's related to this language or something like that. So really problem solving, you might say is kind of an umbrella for any kind of competition, academic competition. And I like to think that it really does cover all of the bases because um, you can do writing for it, you can do performing, um, you do a lot of heavy problem solving in the global um, issues and so on. So there's a lot of diversity uh, offered through future problem solving, but also the skills that are required, you could use in any of those competitions. And so that's why I think that one of the reasons why future problem solving is so special, because even though it's not listed as an academic competition, it really is sort of, um, you know, kind of almost foundational for a, a lot of things that people do in life. So um, your efforts are, are very well spent, I think. I mean, you, you might prefer to, to do another competition and there's a lot of choice out there, but there's a lot of choice and a lot of good skill building and experiences to be gained through future problem solving academic competition. So, Let's move on a little bit here and talk about how it benefits people. Okay, so I put these images together for um, just to kind of get you thinking a little bit more about, well, so what, you know? So what, I'm in an academic competition. Some people really enjoy competitions and some not quite as much as others. And certainly learning to be able to compete is a whole skill in itself because we don't always win, do we? You know, so I guess depending on how you view the competition, you can think about the rewards that you gain for yourself or for maybe for your team or your community. You can think about how other people view you. Like for instance, um, the little girl holding the trophy there Obviously, she seems to like competitions pretty well because she's got uh, trophies, she's got um, badges, and you know she's I, she's quite a competitor, and she seems very proud, and it means a lot to her uh, to have those. So you can get a sense of of really accomplishment, and that's really a good feeling, you know, with or without the awards. Uh, rewards are always nice to to show the effort that we put into something. But um, knowing that you're really good at something or you're getting better at something all the time is really a great feeling. So, so there are external types of rewards, you might say like medals, or even down on the other side, there's some M&Ms. And sometimes in schools, we, we use candy um, as kind of a way of, um, thinking about how well we did. Maybe something very small. Here's some M&Ms, you know, or maybe there's a cash award. And even though it's Bitcoin, you know, it's still a kind of cash. Winning um, is really kind of a big thing in cult in societies, isn't it? We, we like winning teams. We like winners. And uh, so when we win, which isn't always, but when we do, it's a pretty fantastic 
feeling to think that we're an ace at something. And like the little boy um, working on a puzzle there, he's applying himself uh, to figure out where does this piece go and how does it fit? And, you know, putting puzzles together is a little bit like your life too. And as we talk more about Paul Torrance, you're going to see that, wow, his life probably didn't turn out the way that most people would have thought so. So he really proved them wrong, didn't he? Because um, he was a sharecropper's son <laughs> in in rural Georgia. So there was no money. Uh, there was, you know, I wouldn't say food was in great abundance. So, um, you know, that's another thing is to show people that sometimes whatever they think about us, not that we're necessarily and prideful in a bad way about it but maybe they're not right and maybe we're not right about ourselves either and sometimes we have to prove ourselves um that what we're capable of and i know that allison really enjoyed the fireworks when we were at disney uh world this past fall <laughs> and you know disney um celebrates the end of every day with fireworks and it's so very exciting and um so that's that's a good feeling, isn't it? To to see that and to experience sort of a, a really cool thing. And you know what? 50 years of future problem solving is fireworks for us. And I can't wait for international conference. It's going to be very exciting. I don't, are we going to have fireworks there? I hope so. But we'll find out, won't we? <laughs> we'll have our own kind of fireworks. Uh, it'll be very exciting, I'm sure. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit from from academic competitions more into what is future problem solving? You know, it's kind of like we're related to a lot of other things, like in families, you know, we have cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents and stuff. Well, if we were to have like a really close relative in future problem solving, it would be creative problem solving. Now, creative problem solving isn't really an organization like future problem solving is, but it is something that started before uh, future problem solving started. In fact, when it started, E. Paul Torrance knew about it, and he you're going to see how it impacted his thinking and how, you know, we're related to that in a way. So this next section of the talk, we're going to look at creative problem solving. You probably heard that term tossed around quite a bit, but actually it's a way of thinking, okay? Just like in future problem solving. And the, um, the originators of creative problem solving, which is a process that evolved over time, was initiated by someone that you may already know about, because I'm sure you're great students and you know a lot about FPS already, but maybe not. So Alex Osborne, um, he was an executive, a marketing executive who was known all over the world. So he was really huge in his field. That, but you know what? He wasn't a teacher. Uh, now, he was a great speaker and very inspirational. In fact, Something you may know about him is brainstorming because he is the originator of the brainstorming method, okay? But Sidney Parnes, one of his colleagues, was an educator. So when those two got together, really great things happened with the creative problem solving process because you have this marketing guy who's helping um, corporations around the world figure out strategies to, to, to sell their product, products. And that was really, um, you know, kind of how that, that got started. And then Sidney Parnes joined him in that effort. And as creative problem solving evolved, you know, six, you know, five or six times, at least, I think it's on its sixth iteration now, um, it became more and more recognized and used in schools. Okay, so then here's E. Paul Torrance. So you see that he was around during the same time frame as uh, Osborne and Parnes, okay? So as I already said, his early life, he, he grew up 
in rural Georgia. And he was supposed to be a farmer because that's what his dad was. Uh, they were sharecroppers. And, but you know what? Things just didn't turn out that way for him. So sometimes we really need problem solving because we need it just even to solve our own problems. When I, when I taught my students, I would always tell them problem solving is the most important skill you can develop because you will use it every moment of the day. And, you know, maybe that sounds a little bit like an exaggeration, but if you think about it, you're having to solve problems all the time throughout the day, even if they're little tiny problems. And, you know, the more we solve effectively our tiny problems, we're better at solving bigger problems and we just keep getting better and better. Well, Torrance, in a way, had a problem because his health wasn't really well suited to be a farmer. But his father fortunately recognized his talent. And that's another great thing about future problem solving is that it's really great at, at helping people like you uh, develop your talent. So his father finally I don't know if he gave up on him or finally gave in and realized that really his son needed to get more training and go to school and go to college and take advanced coursework and really be challenged academically. So that was a shocker, wasn't it? Because who had gone to school from that family? So his early life turned out to be quite different. And he ended up, oh, taking classes like French, you know, from a sharecropper in Georgia. And he went to a military school to have advanced training because he didn't have a lot of opportunities at that time. And then, you know, the military wanted him to join and serve during the war. And so um, here's another, you know, fork in the road, you might say, because he wasn't assigned to academic, he wasn't assigned to active duty with uh, weapons. He had a different kind of skill. So instead of being on like the front line of the uh, Second World War, what he ended up doing was learning how to give assessments. Um, and if you know anything about his work, you know that he's very well known for one of his assessments of creativity. So this is where he got the training for it was through his service with the military, but again, a different kind of military service, but he was definitely involved in the military. So once again, this, this path that he's on just doesn't seem like it makes any sense maybe, you know? It's easy for us to look back and see how it all makes so much sense. But I imagine at the time, maybe it didn't seem like it was much uh, of anything. But I, although I, I feel like I only know him through his writings, I think he must have applied himself to whatever he did. And he gave the best of himself, whatever he had. He gave the best to, to whether he was a teacher or whether he was a researcher, a counselor even, or um, I guess you could say an evaluator when it comes to assessments. So um, after a number of years of doing these various things in the military and getting his doctorate at the University of Minnesota and things like that, he came back to Georgia. So he'd been in the service and so in Colorado and uh, other places, been in Minnesota to do some advanced work. He was even in Kansas where I live uh, as a counselor. And I find that very exciting part of his time because he was exposed to someone who really impressed him that had um, some, some um, theories and very cutting edge kinds of theories that had to do with dramatics and using drama uh, in people's lives. So I like to, since I evaluate perform scenario performances, I like to think that maybe that particular part of um, future problem solving was inspired in a special way uh, through Torrance. So then, of course, future problem solving, I already told you at the beginning of the talk that 
the schools around him said, hey, we need something more challenging for these kids. They must have had some really great kids in the schools and been very concerned that they spend their time well and learn as much as they could. And then, um, so that was course was in uh, 1974. And 10 years after that, the Torrance Center for Creative Studies was um, started. So they're just studying, they just celebrated their 40th anniversary, which is also very exciting. Okay, so that's a little bit about the or originators, which is Paul Torrance for future problem solving. And for creative problem solving, it's Osborne and Parnes. So now we're going to kind of look and do some comparisons. And I did a timeline for you here to, to sort of uh, solidify how this all happened. You know, how do we get to where we are today, 50 years later? So I started, maybe these aren't the most important to you, but I think they're important um, highlights or, or uh, milestones on this timeline because Torrance was first and always a teacher. You know, a lot of researchers are really wonderful at what they do. And I'm so thrilled that there are some wonderful organizations out there that share the results of their work with schools and teachers and students. And we really, really need them. And it's even more exciting to me when they pursue teaching um, and that they use that research that they've learned so that we know what we're getting through future problem solving actually is what we call evidence-based practices. That's really important, that particular term, in knowing that that it all um, was studied and used and, you know, not just some temporary kind of thing. Because like I showed you, those 15 other organizations, those other competitions, they're still going today because they have solid foundations and FPS is a very solid foundation to it. And even before Torrance went off um, and had to serve in the military and, and got his doctorate and things like that, got his teaching certificate right there in Georgia. Isn't that cool? And he taught high school kids. Well, then look, you know, 1945, Second World War, he was drafted. <laughs> and that is when he learned so much because who's got money in those kinds of days? It's the military. So when you learn something, you know that the military is doing top notch research and, um, studies and so on, because our very existence often depends upon it. And Torrance was very involved with those kind, that kind of work psychologically, okay? So in addition to being an educator, he was also a psychologist, okay? Um, and he used that work as he learned to like work with veterans and um, other kinds of people, lots of diverse people. Um, for some reason, he came to Kansas, uh, to, it's a town called Manhattan, Kansas, where Kansas State University is, and that's where I told you he met with other people um, and learned a lot about dramatics there, and that's actually where he was inspired. They encouraged him, you know, you should really get your doctorate, and so he did, and he went to the University of Minnesota, and he started long-term studies there on creative kids and he worked more with assessment. So it was a really productive time when he was at the university. So at about that very same time when Torrance was developing himself as an educator and a psychologist and an evaluator and all those kinds of things, Osborne's, so if you look at the lower part of the timeline, you're going to see the stuff for CPS, okay? The top part of it is for FPS and Torrance. So down below, you'll see that Osborne created brainstorming, which if you've done uh, brain writing and those kinds of things, they talk a lot about divergent and convergent thinking and how both of them are important to be productive. So just two years after Torrance received his doctorate from the University of Minnesota, Osborne was in New York um, developing CPS. And in 1954, the Creative Education Foundation was established, okay? 
And that is what houses uh, all of this work around CPS, okay? Now, going back to the top line, kind of toggling back and forth, Torrance uh, continued his military service with the Air, or Air Force in Colorado, and he studied ace jet pilots out there. And um, because um, during the wars, like later the Korean War and things like that, um, he needed to train, know how to train people for unusual and interesting experiences during their combats. So he developed, I think it's this is important as a milestone because he's developing a definition of creativity, okay? Creativity can be very difficult to define. And I don't know anybody that other than Torrance who actually came up with a survival definition of creativity. So once again, he is a front runner and this sets him apart from some of his colleagues because how, <laughs> how practical is this? Learning how to survive if your plane gets shot down or something like that, you know? So let's look down at the bottom line again uh, for the, for the another piece of the S, um, CPS uh, puzzle there. In 1966, now we have Osborne and Parnes, the marketing executive and the educator working together. And do you see a similarity here already? A five stage problem solving approach. Now this should start to sound a little familiar to you. And, and it, it should because Torrance literally took inspiration from CPS and everything that was going on there to develop the six step model and future problem solving almost 10 years, not quite 10 years later. And then as I said, 10 years after FBS, the Torrance Center started. So here's a little timeline for you to sort of map out, you know, here's Torrance the educator, Here's the uh, psychologist, the researcher, the evaluator. And where did he start? He started in Georgia. And where does he come back? He comes back to Georgia. And who could have predicted any of that? You know, um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have thought anybody would because, you know, you just, um, we just have to sometimes see where life takes us. All right, so there's that comparison. Now let's do one more comparison between CPS and FPS. So these are the stages that um, kind of make a process for SPS. And then there are steps that relate to each of those stages. So it's organized a little bit differently in SPS. Uh, I'm sorry, CPS. And then in FPS, look at the um, similarities and the differences once again. Um, so remember I talked about divergent and convergent. That's a big, big part of CPS because you have to generate ideas. Remember brainstorming? You have to generate ideas in order to sort of get moving in problem solving. But if that's all you ever do, you're really not going to be terribly productive because you need to converge your ideas. So divergent means you get lots of great ideas um, but then you maybe only need one or two, like in your writing that you do in FPS. And you have to start kind of drilling down and converging. So every one of those steps in CPS has a diverge and converge kind of dynamic. It's a way of thinking. So you need, some people are actually better at divergent thinking. They can just come up with lots of ideas very quickly. And maybe they're not quite as good at convergent and vice versa. So when you're in your teams and you're working together in FPS, it's really good to have those teammates who are different than yourself and who have other kinds of strengths because uh, the two really kind of go together, diverge and converge, and that's where we really get success. So exploring the vision, doesn't that sound a little bit like finding the challenge and figuring out what that is? Then you have to gather data. You have to figure out what is the underlining lining challenge. So don't these look a lot alike so far? Formulating challenges, that means finding solutions, exploring ideas. Well, what kind of criteria is gonna make this work? Formulating solutions, getting that matrix and figuring out how it's all going to work together and then 
making the plan, you know, an action plan like in um, FPS. So there's our, our relative, you might say, of, of creative problem solving and how it relates to future problem solving is part of our 50 year heritage. And is CPS still going? Absolutely is. It is. It's at the um, the State College of Buffalo in New York is where um, most of that effort happens. Okay, so let's um, take a look at where we are now. And this should look familiar. And I've used the new branding, that the new look for FPS that we have, thanks to Allison, sharing some of that information. It's now on the website. So you can see it looks a little different. It should after half a century, shouldn't it? <laughs> so we have some um, a nice fresh look uh, in addition to all the things that we're celebrating this year of um, those six steps. And uh, now you kind of know not only where did this come from and how did we get there, but I hope you also know that this didn't just happen Look at all those years that Torrance um, did evaluation work for the military. Look at all the years he went to college and got degrees and and learned uh, from people, different kinds of people in different places, you know? So, um, and then he came back to Georgia and he still had his feet on the ground, you might say, because he still cared about kids and he still wanted to help them. He still was at heart a teacher. So um, he was all of those things. He was a lot of things. I think we can be very, very, very sure that um, everything um, that he was doing was really well rooted in, in research. And I didn't mention that too much, but um, I did say earlier that he was involved a lot with the other creativity researchers of his time. So they relied on him. And of course, a lot of his work did result in the Torrance test of creative um, of, of creativity. But my understanding is that when asked, Torrance said his greatest accomplishment was future problem solving and starting it. So I'm just going to share with you some of the sources I really, really like for a talk like this. For instance, if you go to the Creative Education Foundation website, and there's uh, right here is the link for that, you're going to find an amazing free resource guide, guide, okay? And it has lots and lots and lots of strategies for convergent and divergent thinking. And I really, really like that. You can just download it. Here's another great website, which I hope you've been to many, many times. And that's Future Problem Solving website. So you're going to see the new look there. You're going to see what all the different kinds of competitions are about, all the different uh, ways you can participate in future problem solving and all the latest news. Um, you can find most of that right there on the website. Um, another one of my favorite uh, resources is the one by Abair, uh, Kram and Nymeister, Mil Millar and Sylvian. And it really is, uh, it's also free. You can just download that. And um, those persons have compiled kind of a short little history on E. Paul Torrance uh, the, as a person, as an educator, as a researcher, and as a psychologist. And, and a lot of the dates I have for this presentation come from that, but not just that. Um, I also did a publication of my own for something called the Palgrave Encyclopedia of the Possible. And that was published in 2000, 2023. And here is the link for that. Now, it's not a direct link because the Palgrave Encyclopedia does cost money, <laughs> but you can access it. So if you go to that um, uh, web page right there with that URL. And then you have to kind of scroll down because it's a really huge encyclopedia. And you go to the Fs and find future problem solving. You can find it there. And it's um, some of the things I talked about here, but I tried to really zero in on the things that I think are really special uh, in that mix of Paul Torrance, future problem solving and uh, SPS. So 
you know, you might have some questions uh, at this point. And if you do, that's great. Um, uh, you can always check with the international office if you have questions about the future problem solving program. Uh, if you have other questions, these resources will help quite a bit. And I didn't put my email here, but you can probably contact me. Um, my email is cphelps at emporia.edu. And then I'm just going to kind of close with one more kind of special slide here, because I want you to think about one more thing. And that is, what has future problem solving meant to you? What, what, how has it changed you as a person? Um, what, what accomplishments have you made? How are you different? And just like Paul T Torrance, you don't really necessarily know uh, what you're going to be doing five or 10 years from now. But I can tell you one thing, the work that you invest in future problem solving is going to be well invested. Um, I did not think I'd be going back to the public schools this fall, but I'm really excited about it. And I can't think of a, a place I'd rather be. So, you know, those forks in the road, we have to learn how to make decisions, gather data, do all those steps that we have in the process. So here's our last slide. I hope you'll enjoy it because it's time to celebrate and get ready for the international conference. And I look forward to seeing you there. So happy 50th Future Problem Solving and let's get ready to celebrate. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you everyone for coming and listening to our great session. Um, if you have any questions, we do have Q&A enabled on this, this um, webinar. So if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them and we will make sure that they are answered. I just wanted to add a very special thank you uh, to Dr. Connie Phelps uh, for sharing a lot of our legacy on the webinar and just reminding us uh, all the wonderful things that our students experience because of the work of our founder, Dr. E. Paul Torrance. So thank you so much for being with us, Connie. I know a lot of preparation um, went into this, and I especially love this ending slide. It just reminds us that we do need to celebrate. So thank you for being with us and, and sharing with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> We've got a thank you. Are there any questions? So far, no questions, just a thank you. Okay. All righty. Well, um, Bonnie, we'll see. see you soon. Okay. Thanks again. All right. And congratulations. Have a wonderful rest of your day, wherever you yeah. are. Yeah. Congratulations on your new career. <laughs> well, I'm kind of re-careering, re just like Torrance went back to Georgia. You know, I'm kind of. <laughs> yeah, but still, that's uh, exciting. Full there, circle. There's, there's so much rejuvenation and gifted education. And certainly, I mean, as a gifted education educator, near and dear to my heart. But I, I feel like that's just an area of education that is going to benefit from you. So I well, think we'll, it's we'll see if I really knew what I was talking about all those years that I taught people to to do that. So I'm excited to go back and 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 have another shot at doing it because I loved it before and I anticipate <laughs> I'll love it again. So thanks again. All right. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, thank Arjun you. and Julie and Belinda. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.